Everybody. Welcome to the Los Angeles Public Library program on Albert Whitman and Company's upcoming release, Coming of Age, 13 Name Mitzvah Stories. Thank you to everyone for being here tonight. I know in our audience we have um, middle grade readers as well as writers and authors who are published already and uh, supporters, cheerleaders. So thank you all for being here. Um, I'm Hilary Perlyubsky. I'm the senior librarian at the Robertson Branch Library. And leading the discussion with me tonight is Lila, who's been volunteering with the Robertson Branch Library since she was 14. She's currently a high school junior, and her hobbies are playing with her cat and, of course, reading. All of our guests here tonight are authors of a story in this collection, and two are editors as well. I'm going to go ahead and introduce them one by one, and if each of you wouldn't mind, um, just after I introduce you, jump in and say how you became involved with this project. Um, let's start with Jonathan Rosen. Jonathan Rosen is transplanted New Yorker who now lives with his family and rescue dog Parker in sunny South Florida. When not writing, he can be found with his family. He is the author of Night of the Living Cuddle Bunnies and its sequel, From Sunset Till Sunrise. He is an administrator of FromTheMixedUpFiles.com, a site devoted to middle grade books, and a founding member of SpookyMiddleGrade.com, a site devoted to spooky middle grade. He also co-hosts a YouTube show with Ike Eisenman from Disney's Escape to Witch Mountain called Pop Culture Retro. And you'll be able to see his um, website on the screen for more information. And Jonathan, if you could just um, tell us how how did this project come about, or how did you get involved with it? Well, first, thanks thanks for having me. Thanks for hosting this. And very much appreciated. Um, this came about because there are a lot of things that you know. The past few years, mainly, there's been so much anti-Semitism. It's like you know more than a few years. And there's a big pushback, and you know, probably shouldn't say, it, but I will. <laughs> big pushback against Jewish stories, in uh, to me, in in the kid lit world entirely. So I wanted to do something to showcase Jewish stories, to showcase, you know, that because of that, that you know, shows that Jews, you know, let people see Jews as just like everyone else, wanting to have uh, be like everyone else, basically, and maybe it'll, you know, starting with kid lit it can help alleviate some of the problems with uh, anti-Semitism. Kids just see them, Jewish kids, first of all, seeing themselves and other kids seeing, you know, Jewish kids are not much separate from them. So wanted to do an anthology. I spoke to some other people about it, uh, wanting to do it. And then, you know, now we need a collection. We need authors to do this. So, uh, you know, Henry had previously asked me to do something about, you know, a, a website. So it fell through, but I spoke to Henry about wanting to, like, let's get some authors together instead and let's do this anthology. And, uh, you know, he graciously accepted. And we had a lot of any, you know, for the predominantly every author that either I asked or I know that Henry asked eagerly jumped aboard. So that was really nice and really uh, made me feel good for one that, you know, that authors were willing to participate in this and for a good cause. And, uh, Part of the also proceeds we wanted to go to, you know, organizations which would fight anti-Semitism, and uh, so I think this is an important book on many cases, and I'm just grateful that everyone participated. I love their stories, and uh, and I thank everyone for doing it. Thank you. Yeah, as somebody who's never been to a bar or bat mitzvah, I felt this <laughs> um, book was really special for me to read and feel kind of in the know a little bit. Um, so thank you. All right, let's move on to Henry. Henry Hertz authored 10 traditionally published children's books, Monster Goose, Nursery Rhymes, When You Give Up, When You Give an Imp a Penny, Mabel and the Queen of Dreams, Little Red Cuttlefish, Captain Rex and His Clever Crew, How the Squid Got Two Long Arms, Alice's Magic Garden, 
Good Egg and Bad Apple, Two Pirates Plus One Robot, and the critically acclaimed I Am Smoke. Three of his short stories will appear in Highlights for Children and one in Ladybug Magazine. He also writes middle grade, young adult, and adult sh short stories. He can be found at henryhertz.com. And Henry, if you could just give us a, a how did you get involved with this uh, project? Well, I think Jonathan, Jonathan gave away my secret. He, he invited me, so I was uh, very happy to participate. I, I agree with him that this was a, an important thing to be done. And of course, if you write, if you love writing, then you, you, you don't turn down a chance to edit and write. And you, uh, you jump on it with uh, full enthusiasm, and that's what I did. And so um, it's been a labor of love for both of us. And, uh, We've had the pleasure and honor of working with some really talented authors and I really just can't wait to see how people receive everybody's hard work. Thank you. Okay. And now we have uh, Barbara Botner. Barbara Botner's work covers all areas of children's literature, including young adults, I Am Here Now, 2020 with Macmillan, Best Books of the Year list, Banks, Bank Street, Middle Grade Chapter, uh, sorry, <laughs> that didn't come out right, Middle Grade uh, Chapter, I Can Read. She's most known for her award-winning picture books, which have been animated, translated into multiple languages, and appeared on the New York Times bestseller list. She's worked with celebrated illustrators, including Caldecott winner Peggy Rathman, Michael Emberley, Chris Chaban, Chaban, Victoria Chess. She's won the Distinguished Teaching Award from the New, York, New School for Social Research, taught at Parsons School of Design, UCLA, Miami Dade College, and lectured on children's literature around the country, as well as presenting in Bologna, know that, for SCBWI, and staffed and judged national contests on children's literature, as well as written for both the New York and LA Sunday Times Book Review. Oh my goodness, Barbara, that's so much I could barely get it out of my mouth. <laughs> and um, Barbara, how did you uh, how did you get to yes for this project? Um, well, so I met Henry at a conference which he had invited me to, and um, we enjoyed talking to each other. And then he told me about this project. And it said, I always wanted to do a specifically Jewish book. And I've tried to add Jewish flavor into some of my picture books. I did a book called Hannah, Hannah, Nana Hannah's Piano. And it was just, it was very Hamish, we say, as a Yiddish word. And I, and I, tr I tried, you know, even with smaller publishers to find the right, the right project. And it never happened. Then Henry invited me to participate, and I just said yes. I didn't even think about it. Then when I came to writing, the, well, I won't go into that, I don't think. But it was a challenge because um, at first I had no ideas. So um, I had to work through having a deadline and not having anything to talk about. And then I did discover something I really, really wanted to write about. So I'm grateful to have that opportunity. Thank you. Us too, your story was really fun to read. Thank you. Okay, and last but definitely not least is um, Stacia Deutsch. She, uh, Rabbi Stacia Deutsch has written more than 300 books. Wow. wow. In addition to her award-winning creative chapter book series entitled Blast to the Past, Stacia has also ghostwritten for a popular girls mystery series, A Secret Celebrity, and published nonfiction texts. In April, she is launching the spin-off to the Boxcar Children Mysteries called The Jesse Files. Ooh. Additionally, Stacia has written junior movie tie-in novelizations for summer blockbuster films, including Boss Baby 2 and the New York Times bestsellers, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs Jr. movie novel and the Smurfs movie novels. And Stacia, how did... Um, how did, what's your connection to this project originally? It sounds like my connection is the same as everyone else's, which is Henry. Um, they say that there's six degrees of separation, but Henry seems to one be the one person in the world that connects us all. Um, I, I am an ordained rabbi. I have written very little in the Jewish space. I feel a little bit like I share that with Barbara. 
um, a lot of Smurfs, Lego, um, other things, but I have been wanting to do something um, with a Jewish theme. And Henry came to me with this and it was such an obvious smooth fit for me that there was no way I was going to say no. So it wasn't a matter of saying like, Ooh, let me think about it. It was just a resounding yes. How do I get involved? And that's how I got into the um, book. And I'm super happy to be amongst all these other really amazing writers. Thank you so much for having us tonight. Yes, it is really fun to get to know um, so many accomplished authors. I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Lila, who has uh, a question for each of you. Uh, she's going to read a little passage from each of your stories so that um, just to give the audience a little flavor and a little context for her question. And um, and then she'll ask specifically uh, each one of you a, a question. And then I'll come back at the end to do one more general question. So go ahead, Lila. Hi, OK. So we're starting off with the pocket watch. So I'll read a short paragraph, and then we'll get into the question. He laughed again and gave me a light punch on the arm. Wise guy. He rubbed his chin as he stared at me. You know, I was going to give you something after your bar mitzvah, but maybe I'll give it to you now. It might cheer you up a little. I perked, and, I perked up and arched my eyebrow. What? Something that's been in our family for a long, long time. I tried to give it to your mother once, but she didn't want the responsibility. Responsibility? What is it? He reached inside his pants pocket and fished out a small, round, gold object. It was a little smaller than the top of a soda can. I pointed to it. What is that? He held it up in front of my face. It's a pocket watch. Okay, and I think that connects to our question here. So your story is all about... Oh, sorry. Did you say something? Okay. Your story is all about the importance of having a bar bat mitzvah and how it preserves the generational chain and recognizing being able to celebrate that bar bar mitzvah. How can children celebrating a bar or bat mitzvah today gain a greater understanding of that generational chain? It, you know, it, it's an important tradition. It, it's, you know, symbolic about becoming an adult, a bar and bat mitzvahs. And to me, it's, you know, the whole thing with mattered was about the the concept of not breaking the chain. I mean, my parents always drummed it into my brain when, when I was younger. I do the same thing to my kids, you know, the importance of, you know, traditions, family traditions and Jewish traditions and not wanting to be the one that, you know, does break that, does veer off from that. And every and every generation usually it, the norm is you do a little bit less and a little bit less than the previous generation, but you know everyone does whatever they can. But you know you don't want to be the one to sever complete ties. So that was the concept for me, doing something like that to show the the passing on of traditions and why it's so important. And in the story, you know, they showed several places where you couldn't have bar mitzvahs, you couldn't have a bat mitzvah, you you couldn't celebrate being Jewish at all. So that was one of the things important to me that you know. It's not the whole thing of now, like a lot of things, bar mitzvahs, it's what celebrity you're going to get, what, you know, what themes you could do. So, you know, all that, all that's fun, but it's not the main point of the celebration. It's not the main point of having it that, uh, you know, it is a, a huge symbol in Jewish tradition. And that is, that is the main point that the, the main character got to see that carrying on Jewish tradition was, was the, the main thing for him to think about during the bar mitzvah. So that, like I said, not breaking a chain is is one of the things that, you know, I try to live my life in Judaism as well as other things as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next story, Bar Mitzvah on Planet Latka. So I'm going to read the passage. I crouched lower behind the bush as she left. I smiled despite my embarrassment. I now knew what my, what my Bar Mitzvah project would be something that would help the orphanage and impress Shana Plunum. I would find fuel for the reactor. So that ties into our question. A big theme in the story, as seen with the alien characters, is projects for one's bar about mitzvah, and also how they connect to the Torah portion he reads, and Schlimazel's speech about how the portion connects to the balance of caring for others and connecting to himself. Did you have a bar mitzvah project growing up, and why did you choose to add this to the story specifically? 
So back in, in my day, when I was bar mitzvahed, it wasn't a common practice to have bar mitzvah projects. So I did not. It's, it's a more, I think it's a more modern tradition and it's a wonderful one. Um, I, I, my story is, of course, about an alien having a bar mitzvah on a different planet. And uh, he still, is, so bar mitzvahs have a Torah portion that's read and it's common that the bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah uh, gives a speech and talks about what they take away from studying that portion. So I felt that was an appropriate component of my story. And um, I, I could have picked any Torah portion. It really wouldn't have mattered as long as I drew a relevant lesson. But I thought, given the story I wanted to tell about this boy, he's He's got a crush on this girl. Well, she's not really a girl. She has eight tentacles, but a female. Um, so he's focused on her, but he's also focused on, he's torn between focus on her and focus on the significance of the religious ceremony. He's torn between the religious ceremony and having a fancy party that will impress her. And he's also got a, a bar mitzvah project that he's trying to help a charity. and. So it's pulling him in different directions. And I thought, you know, that's the particular Torah portion that I base this on has a lot of stuff in it. But one of the things is about giving to charity. So it just seemed like a, a nice a nice way to ground what's otherwise a crazy story about a tentacled alien having a bar mitzvah in the actual, uh, some Jewish teachings. And I just want to point out this 13 stories in this anthology only three of them, in fact, I was surprised it was as many as three, were science fiction. And you have all three science fiction story authors in this in this event just by chance. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Thank you. So now we'll move on to the second ever Bat Mitzvah of New York City. So let's read the passage. Shy people should not be expected to go on stage and chant in Hebrew, while their every last muscle nervously vibrates for the entire world to see or in my case, the Lower East Side. But this is my situation. I'm the first girl to be a bat mitzvah since Miss Judith Kaplan of the Upper West Side two years ago in 1922. So our question is, as mentioned in the story, Hannah is a young Jewish woman having a bat mitzvah, which was obviously unique for the 1920s. Her mother is also a feminist, specifically in the Jewish sphere, something else which was less common for the time. So what inspired you to add the theme of feminism into the story in relation to Jewish culture? Our phone is ringing, I'm sorry. Um, well, when I thought about where to set the story, um, I had I had lived in the on the Lower East Side. I had been in the theater. I thought I turned it off. Um, and it's a very, um, it, it, the Lower East Side was, an amazing hubbub of Jewish ac Jewish immigrant activity uh, in the early 1920s. So I started to hunt around for information about when bat mitzvahs were allowed to be here because in Europe uh, it, 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 it was more traditional just to have bar mitzvahs. And I found that the first bat mitzvah was in 1922. And... Um, and even when I was bat mitzvahed, it was kind of a, um, it, it was it was a wonderful thing to be bat, bat mitzvahed because it made you take the stage, it made you do study, it made you uh, have to think about the the Torah po portion that you were dealing with, and it was it was sort of a pro feminist thing. But I also felt that a lot of what I knew about the Jewish religion. I had a lot of questions about the role of women in the Jewish tradition. And so that's what I decided to explore. And I set the, 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 the piece in um, a theater that's run all by women. And it, it was called the Jewish Rialto. It was a very, as I said, very vibrant um, place to be. And a lot of famous actors came out of it. And I just created a shy girl, which I'm not. But I felt that that was a great dynamic for someone to have to deal with uh, being on stage and commanding, you know, uh, everyone's attention. And there was an internal dynamic there that I thought was interesting. Um, but also to have a, 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 a not a wealthy family, um, 
and, and have it, the rabbis didn't want to bother with girls. They were busy with the bar mitzvah, so a boy. And I thought, so I, I created the, the grandfather as her teacher. And the story just sort of came to life as I went into the characters. I just felt that I knew them. And I actually did live on the Lower East Side. So in a way, I, I had a kinship with all of that. Um, and in terms of the Torah po portion, um, I picked a portion where, I forget her name now because I haven't read it lately, but it, it's based on a female who helps win a battle from uh, using her wits. And um, it, it seemed like a very apropos uh, thing for someone who's dealing with how do I go forward as a Jewish woman and how do I not feel marginalized because Jewish women are somewhat marginalized in various factors of the of, the, of Judaism, sometimes not. But I thought that was a very good um, way to set up the story and with a lot of tension. And but I, I really mostly think it's kind of funny, and uh, I had a really good time doing it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. I thought that was like really interesting. Okay, so now for our last but not least passage, um, Helping Noah, a time travel adventure. Without a word, the stranger pointed at the empty chair across from the rabbi's desk. I tightened my grip around my Hebrew folder, which contained copies of the prayers, plus my speech, and sat. In the silence, I studied the stranger's reflection in the window. Short hair, thick glasses, dark eyes. And when the stranger smiled, there was something in that grin that made me shiver. There's the matter of the flood, the stranger said, then paused as if waiting for me to reply. So for our question, the decision to put your main character, Simon, into the story of Noah's Ark was really interesting. How did you decide to add a magic realism theme to your story? And why did you choose the story of Noah specifically? Hi, thanks for the question. Um, I love time travel. It is my all time favorite. And my very first series I ever wrote with a friend was called Blast to the Past. And it was about four kids who time travel and meet famous people in American history. And I have been saying forever, oh, I'd love to do something Jewish with a time travel. What am I going to do? How am I going to do it? And I've tried a couple things, but nothing ever felt right. And then this story came along. And at first, I tried a different Torah portion. I was going to send Simon into the um, building of the tabernacle. I thought, oh, I should pick like a story that's not as interesting, not as exciting, that we could make really exciting by, I don't know, having somebody steal the dolphin skins and he has to chase them down. I don't know. I was like all over the place with the story. And something just came to me that that wasn't the right place for him. Um, I think that there's some really, really good stories in the Torah that are a lot more intriguing and certainly have a lot more exciting moments. And I liked the idea that Noah was the most righteous person in his generation, but he was still <laughs> not such a great guy. So um, when I thought about how did I want to craft a Jewish time travel story, I also went where Jonathan went and I said, okay, I like this idea of the chain of tradition. So what happens is that every generation, the person who has the bar bat mitzvah before has to train the person, the next person, who has to go into the story and solve some kind of problem in their Torah portion. And that's the real crux of when they transition in Bar and Bat Mitzvah. So I decided to shoot for Noah's Ark. And the girl who had her Bat Mitzvah the week before has to take Simon and teach him about Noah and about the Ark from the inside, which is much different than what we do when we write a sermon for our congregation at our bar bat mitzvah, we think about like, what's our message that we'd like to give, but wouldn't it be amazing if we could go back and actually live through that story ourselves? To me, that's like the science fiction part and that's the time travel that I love and adore. So I was really thrilled to get to mess around with that. I'd love to do more tour portion time travel jumps. That would be cool. Thank you so much. I really like that time travel. Okay, so now that we're finished interviewing everybody individually, we have a closing question for all of you and whoever wants to answer first can feel free to jump in. So our closing question is, 
What is it that you hope readers will take away from your story and the collection as a whole? And is there anything you'd like to say specifically to our audience here tonight? Should we go around again? Is, let's yeah, go around works. again. Okay, so um, from my story, you know, I, I, I had toyed back and forth the same thing, what to write about and, you know, what do a memoir type thing, more story, you know, something personal. And I, to me, that I figured a lot of people would be writing about that. So like, like uh, else mentioned, I wanted to do something sci-fi. Just for me, I just wanted something that's entertaining. That's all I wanted, something to take out of it, something entertaining and uh, with a Jewish, Jewish character and Jewish flavored. Uh, just enjoy the stories. That's to me, that's the main thing. Just enjoy the stories and see other Jewish kids uh, doing, living like them. Just the Jewish kids are, you know, just like everyone else. That's the one of the things, except, you know, believe a different, you know, religion. But uh, that's all I wanted them to take out of this for, at least for my, my story. Just be entertained and to think a little bit. As far as uh, the people as a whole, I would like, hopefully people buy it, you know, not Jews and non-Jews. Hopefully people buy it. And uh, I do think that they'll be entertained. It is for, I think it's important to showcase Jewish stories, Jewish characters, and uh, Jewish representation. And it is for a good cause, you know, whether that, that beside the, besides the point, but it is. And uh, I, like I said, the most thing I want is just for people to be entertained by this. Jump in, uh, Henry, before you go and um, tell the audience that if the audience would like to ask any questions, you can put them while while everybody else is giving their um, their answers, put them in the chat and we'll try to get to those before we finish the program. So please put any questions you have for any of our authors in the chat. Thanks. Shall I go next? Yes. Um, like Jonathan, my primary hope is that readers are entertained by the story. But having written picture books, there's, there's almost a requirement that you write something entertaining, but buried in there, not in a didactic way, is a lesson, something beneficial to the reader. And I think it's kind of a cool um, tenet of Judaism to balance charity for others with taking care of yourself. I mean, think of the extreme case. If you give all your money to charity, you have nothing for yourself. Now you become a burden on society. So you have to strike a balance in all things, but certainly in, even in kindness, you can't be infinitely kind because you leave nothing for yourself. So I just think that's a cool, interesting theme that you don't hear very much about. And um, I do want to emphasize Jonathan's point that this is written for all audiences. So obviously I can imagine Jewish parents buying this for their kids, but we hope that non-Jewish people read this as well because part of, uh, defeating hatred is familiarity. And if people realize, oh, Jewish 13-year-olds are a heck of a lot like non-Jewish 13-year-olds, I think that goes a long way in uh, uh, fighting anti-Semitism and hatred in general. At, because of oops, Jonathan's point, uh, I just learned that there's an African proverb that says, don't accept a shirt from a naked man. That's all. And you're up, Barbara, next for your um, oh, what you sorry. hope, what you yeah. hope uh, yeah. people take away from the book as a whole and from your story. Oh, that's a lot. The book as a whole. <clears throat> well, I think it's a, a great it as a collection. It really touches on so many different points, and 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 I'm not going to speak to all of them, obviously. In terms of my own story, um, uh, this character is um, has to deal with her own fears, her shyness. And um, and her and her place in society, and how the the Torah portion makes her see that she's capable of more than she imagines she's capable of, and she's able to dig deep into herself and actually come out as uh, you know stronger and more um, more confident, but. I hope none of those things are exactly what people know as they leave the book, just that they get the sense that the character has been able to grow and um, and also and and has learned from inspira the inspiration 
of when you read and when you study, you are going to expand your horizons. You are going to become a bigger person, a better person, a more emphatic person. But I hope all of that is pretty subliminal. And like the others have said, I hope that they're entertained. Stacia? Yeah, okay. So, um, so my husband and I recently moved to a small town with a small congregation. And um, a few weeks ago, we went to a bat mitzvah. And I've been thinking a lot about the difference beca between becoming bar bat mitzvah in a town when, where there are so few Jewish students and in a place, I don't know, like Los Angeles, where there's so many Jewish students. Um, and I think that a book like this with 13 very different stories, and I read all of them, and I thought some of them I super resonated towards and some of them less so. But now that I live in this small town and have met this diverse group of people who are just trying to make their way in the Jewish world, um, I think that each of the stories has the power to resonate to different children in individual ways. And that's what's really important about this. So if you're not into time travel, which I can't imagine why you wouldn't be, but if you aren't, Again, I can't imagine why you wouldn't be. Um, but it, if for some reason that's not your thing, then maybe Barbara's story speaks to you. Or maybe if you're super into sci-fi and you love Star Wars and Star Trek, maybe Henry's story is the one that's going to resonate to you or one of the other authors. And I think this is such an amazing opportunity wherever we are. And I like how people said it's not necessarily just for Jewish readers, but for all readers that just find one that resonates to you on an emotional level, on a human level. And that's all I can ask for the book is that each story finds a place in somebody's heart. That's what I would want. Yeah. Well, I, um, I found that like um, Stacia just said, and Henry mentioned, I was surprised myself to, um, find such a variety of stories in um, these 13, 13 short stories. And I mean, it really is a reflection of the world as it is. And um, it's exactly what I would expect from any book of short stories for middle graders to have a, such a, a lovely variety. And, um, and that for me, that just made, um, that that made this it was really eye opening because I think I, I didn't know that I thought of maybe Jewish stories as maybe historical fiction or um, you know a certain genre. But reading these and being surprised by that, I thought, wow, I think my mind was just opened. And I'm not even a middle grader. <laughs> um, we do have one more question, uh, and I think we have time to go around if um, if that's okay with you. Let me get it. Um, Let's see. Um, each of your stories features um, such a distinct setting. How did you decide where to set your stories, especially in relation to the topic at hand of bar and, bar and bat mitzvah? Um, some of you have already kind of gone over that, but uh, if you wouldn't mind quickly kind of talking about your setting, that'd be great. Um, I'll, you know, I'm starting. Uh, again, since my whole thing was about about you know showing the not the important thing is not necessarily the the display and you know who's going to be there so i just wanted to have it at you know right before the kids bar mitzvah and you know him him worrying about that oh this one had uh, this celebrity this one had this rock star and again that's not what important so it was just in his little area his his world his room we're starting off and you know him him getting upset about that so then my story is also time travel related. So that's what uh, happened. So then he goes over to different areas showing where you could not had, uh, have a bar mitzvah, where you could not do things and show Jewish display. And, you know, one of the places, you know, it's all in the news, the same country in the news now today is in the news back then. The same reasons a lot of, you know, my, one of the places was Russia. So where you could not uh, show uh, Judaism, you could not 
you know, you know, Jews were persecuted. So, and, you know, you had to hide getting a bar mitzvah a lot of times. So that's one of the things that he needed. You know, I wanted the character to see that the important, this is not the important, the important thing is the ceremony itself. Everything else is just, you know, just for a show or whatever. It doesn't mean anything. So that's what my setting was uh, for that. And before I go to chance again, I don't know if we're going to come back, but I do want to thank you for doing this again. This is very, very thank gracious you. for you, very important uh, to me and, you know, everyone else. And whoever is watching, thank you. And whoever does buy the book, especially, thank you. <laughs> Anyone else want to jump in? I will. Um, the, I, I did touch on this before, uh, the way the way the Lower East Side was such a an important landing place for immigrants and how Jewish families st stuck together. And the family that my bat mitzvah takes place inside of is very knitted together, which of course is not the way things are so much anymore. <clears throat> and um, I, I, I think I wanted to I wanted to get people interested in that era uh, precisely because people supported each other. They they had open open doors to each other. Um, they had a lot of fun because they were they were knit together, um, coming from you know torment in Europe. And I just thought it was a great place to set a story. Um, and and as much as I could make it come alive. And since I did live on the Lower East Side and I knew the restaurants and I knew the actors that were prominent, um, I felt like I could give it that kind of texture. And, you know, as a period in history, I'd also written about the Triangle uh, Fire, uh, Triangle Factory Fire. And it's just an amazing time. And it's, it's also a time that Jews, as they landed here, really made their place, you know, they really made their place um, in America and it was in New York and they were on the Lower East Side. So I just thought it was fascinating. That's it. Would you like me to go? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I, um, so my story takes place on planet Latka. Um, <laughs> For those that don't know, latke is a potato pancake, which just makes it even sillier. Um, why did I choose to put it on an alien planet that doesn't really exist? Two reasons. Um, in writing my story, I had not yet seen the other stories, so I wanted to make sure mine was different. <laughs> so I figured, okay, if I... And the other was I do love writing fantasy and science fiction. That's my two favorite genres. So. Um, for both those reasons, I thought, why don't I put it on another planet? That frees me up to have some, uh, you know, weirdness that's funny, at least to me. And it also kind of helps with the theme of, you know, part of this whole anthology is norming the other. In other words, helping non-Jews realize that how much Jews and non-Jews have in common. And so if a human reader can feel things in common with a tentacled alien from planet Latka, hopefully that same human reader can uh, feel connected with people regardless of their religion. So that's what led me to choose uh, that setting. So I talked a little bit about like why I chose the Noah's Ark setting. Um, it's cold, it's rainy, it's exciting. You could get squashed by an elephant or eaten by a lion and you got to get everybody on the boat. <laughs> like to me, that just natural tension, natural anxiety. I don't like rain and I don't like animals. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I have a question for Barbara though. Can I ask a question? Am I yes, allowed? you're well, allowed. <laughs> at the very beginning, you said how you didn't have a story at all and how difficult it was for you to find one. And then you started to say how you ended up with this, but then we moved on. Can you, I'm dying to know. I can confess, um, <laughs> I had forgotten about the project to my embarrassment. And I saw that there was a deadline and I had and I had nothing. And I, I always go to my, I, I write from real life usually. So 
I visited my own bat mitzvah, came up with zero, nothing. And um, if it wasn't for the good effort of Henry to, to talk to me um, and, and brainstorm. And he said, the thing I remember he said was, well, if you didn't see anything in your own um, memory that you wanted to draw on, why don't you pick a, an era that interests you? I mean, it came right out of his mouth. And immediately I just thought of the Lower East Side. And um, yeah, so once I, once I let my, myself go, it was pretty easy to write it, actually. Um, so that's a good lesson for me, because I, I don't, well, I guess anything you write about yourself, if you're my age, is historical fiction. But anyway, that's what it was. That's how it came out. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Thanks for everybody to be here tonight. Yeah, thank you everybody for participating. A big thank you to Lila. Um, I thought Lila and I were gonna have to go back and forth for like weeks about uh, writing these questions and just, she just sent me these perfect, interesting, amazing questions right off the bat. So that made my job really easy. Um, but thank you to all of you for being here. Um, the book is scheduled to come out in April. Is that yeah. still correct? Yeah. So um, we're going to have the book at Los Angeles Public Library. Um, you can order it at your local branch, um, or you can buy it in any bookstore. So uh, please look out for that. This uh, interview will be recorded. So if you want to share it with somebody or watch it later again, um, please do. And um, you can uh, check out more library programs um, at LAPL.org or um, Robertson Branch Library programs at our uh, Robertson Branch location on the website. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. And have a good night. Good night.